Shalom and welcome to this special edition of the Middle East Report. As Israel is at war, we have a special guest from the Israeli embassy to give us an update on the situation that Israel is in. Warm welcome to the program and today's special guest is all the way from Israel but he's currently working for the Israeli Embassy in London. His name is Jonathan Wiegler and he's the Vice Council of the State of Israel to the UK. Um, Jonathan, it's a, a pleasure to have you on the program and I'm me. sorry that we're having to record this program today under such tra uh, tragic and horrendous circumstances uh, as Israel's at war. Um, but, but first, before we unpack some of the latest developments taking place and the challenges facing Israel and the Jewish people right now. Uh, can you just share a, a story of, of your family background? Because you, you told me that uh, your parents, uh, your father was originally from, from Britain, he made Aliyah and, and that you were born in Israel. So share with us your uh, incredible family background. Absolutely. So as any Jewish family uh, in the 21st century will tell you, families go back to Eastern Europe and both sets of my grandparents came from Eastern Europe. My father's grandparents moved to the UK. My mother's grandparents moved from Belarus via Turkey to Chile wow. and they had my, my parents were born and they grew up and they made Aliyah both of them to Israel and uh, they met in Israel and I was born in Israel as the first generation of the Uyghur family to be born in Israel. My dad has since become a Jewish agency in mystery and he has been posted both in London and in the United States um, on jobs doing, dealing with Israel education and with Jewish education, uh, something that he remains very compassionate to his heart today. Uh, he has left the Jewish education sector, Jewish education sector today, and he is now the chief executive of the British Board of Deputies for British Jews. That's amazing. In the United Kingdom, absolutely. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. And um, Jonathan, uh, you know, as we're recording this program today, we know that Israel has called up over 300,000 uh, reservist soldiers for the Israeli Defense Force, known as the IDF. Um, share with us uh, your experience of, of serving in the IDF, because we know that any native-born Israeli like yourself who's a Sabra, this is mandatory, isn't it? Absolutely. So I spent four years in the IDF myself. I'm a lieutenant in reserve duty. I served for four years on the Gaza Strip, actually. I served in the nearest base to the Gaza border at the Eris Crossing itself. I served in a small unit called Kogat, which is the coordinator of government activities in the territories. And what my department did amongst the other departments within the base was coordinate international aid into the Gaza Strip. So I served from 2014 until 2018, and the crux of what we did was providing international aid to Gaza after the Protective Edge operation in 2014, um, helping rebuild hospitals and homes and schools and, ph and pharmacies and libraries and anything that needed international support, we facilitated to make sure that that would happen. And, and share with the, what's that experience like, to actually be um, on that... Uh uh, you know, Israel-Gaza checkpoint, because we saw, obviously we show as well, some, some videos as well, of the frightening scenes when, when Hamas um, literally destroyed those Israeli soldiers and murdered those Israeli soldiers at the checkpoint um, and then broke through the war into Israel and then just carried out what can only be described as the kind of mass terrorist attack or a pogrom, genocide, war crimes, call it what you like, absolutely barbaric. So share with us what it was like to be stationed so close to, to Gaza. So uh, in, in those four years, it was a base that's so close to the Gaza border that you don't hear the red alert siren. You hear the rocket, you run into the shelter, and only then do you hear the siren and have to run for safety. And so for four years there really keeps you grounded as to how strong and powerful the IDF is, that we can have a presence so close to the Gaza border, be so uh, emotionally invested into the work that we do to improve the situation in the Gaza Strip, and yet at the same time, you know, four years after I finished my military service, things like this happen. And, and the absurdity of it is that our base that was in charge of you know, developing and, and supporting the Gazan population through the international community was the first to be pillaged and burned. We sadly had three people from our base who were killed. Um, and my prayers are with their families and with their friends and with their loved ones. No, absolutely, absolutely horrific. And, and Jonathan, what, what attracted you to uh, join the um, Israeli Foreign Ministry when it looks very clearly you could have had a, a, a career in the Israeli Defence Force? Absolutely. So. Uh, I finished the army because I wanted to go and start my university degree. And whilst I was doing my university degree, I realized that my actual passion was to serve the state of Israel. 
And through that, I started looking at student jobs and I saw that a job opened up at the Israeli Foreign Ministry in the crisis room. So I served as an emergency analyst and I spent two and a half years there helping Israelis out who were in any sort of emergency around the world. And from that job, my manager got promoted to become the Consul General here in London and she asked me to come be her Vice Consul in the UK and I very happily obliged. Wonderful. So show us um, what your role entails um, I exactly at the embassy, because there's, there's so many different roles from the ambassador to the deputy ambassador, to the head of public affairs, to the head of, uh, of um, head of the media. Uh, and also, you know, you've got the consular service um, helping Israelis get visas and what have you and other uh, Jewish people to make Aliyah as well. So what, what does your role entail? Yes, so, so as you say correctly, the consular departments, different from the other departments in the embassy, is the face of the state of Israel towards the Israeli populations who live and reside in the UK. So we help them with their passports, we help them with registering their family status, we notarize their documents, and we provide any sort of support that they need to make sure that their stay in the UK is you know, as close to home as possible. We like to be remind them what you know, Israel is as their home country. Um, in the last you know, 12 days since the war has started, we have been helping reservists who wish to go back to Israel and serve uh, during this war. So we facilitated the majority of last week flights to help get people back into Israel to serve in the army and we've also been helping Israelis who have escaped the war mainly from around the Gaza area who are here in the UK find temporary places to stay until you know the, the war resides and they can uh, return to their homes. Excellent well, I'm so pleased you can be here to represent the, the state of Israel and you know our thoughts and our prayers are with Israel and also the Jewish people at this time not only in Israel but also in the UK they're also under threat as well. Um, can you just share with us um, where you were on Saturday the 7th of October, which will now go down as a day of infamy. This was the worst mass terrorist attack in Israel's history. Uh, I think the, uh, the Israeli president um, Herzog described it very well when he said that is, the Jewish people have not faced uh, a single massacre on one day for over 80 years, and that was the Holocaust. And it just shows you the magnitude of this. So tell us where you were and how did you find out about this horrific terrorist attack so on Israel? Last Saturday the 7th of October, was also a Jewish festival of Simchat Torah. And I myself was abroad on personal leave, but uh, as I checked my phone in the morning, you know, I don't usually check my phone on, on Sabbath mornings, but being away on leave and being on such a post in the embassy, you have to be available at all times. So I opened it and I saw the messages and the flurry of messages and updates of everything that had happened. Uh, and immediately we got into work and, and we started realizing that we're gonna have to get Israelis back into Israel as fast as we can. Uh, we're going to have to start coordinating with the families of the different people who have died and who had some sort of British citizenship and we've been in touch with a number of those families, sadly. And that's been just, just the day since, since I've gone by, sadly. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on, on this Hamas mass terrorist attack that took place has taken the uh, which is the led to the murder of 1400 israelis um oh, between 100 and 160 maybe even 300 taken um, um hostages and taken into gaza with over 3000 uh, wounded and that's not to say all the damage and destruction done by the rockets fired by hamas and palestinian islamic jihad so i mean i think we need to call it what it is this is the 21st century reincarnation of nazi ideology these people have nothing but aims to destroy the Jewish race in the Jewish homeland of the State of Israel. And when you see this, the cowardly attack that they launched on the 7th of October, starting with the poor 250 festival goers in Kibbutz Re'im, these people, you know, they were out celebrating love, they were celebrating music, they were having a good time, and from, you know, from the middle of nowhere, they suddenly find themselves running for shelter and hiding, and hiding in the bushes for hours upon end, trying to escape these, you know, the terrorists from Hamas who came in and tried to kill. And, you know, it, it really breaks your heart to think that the Jewish people haven't had to endure something, as you've said, something like this since the Holocaust. And this is really, really reminiscent of the same sentiments that we went through 80 years ago as a Jewish people. And also share with us how many Israelis um, will be feeling now, knowing that pretty much uh, that uh, border with Gaza was before seen as unbreachable, that this, that Israel had almost the most technologically advanced border in the world with, uh, with Israel and Gaza, and to know that Hamas breached that in the most horrific way, setting off IED explosives on the, on the actual border itself, using paragliders to land into Israel, um, even coming into Israel uh, with boats, and then the fact that these poor Israeli communities in the south had to face over 2,500 Hamas fighters that they only had one intent and that was to kill as many civilians as they could. I think, as I said, the, the attack happened on the morning of Simchat Torah and in the IDF, 
when there are festivals and when there are weekends, you send soldiers home and you only keep the minimum needed to protect the borders of the state of Israel. And this is why I call it a cowardly attack, because what they did is they went through the fences of the borders. They found the small places where the IDF weren't at that moment and given the time. They've obviously been watching us for a couple, for a couple of months, you know, training for this absolute moment. They take advantage of that, and that's when they go in and attack the communities. On a Sabbath morning, when people are sleeping in their houses, you know, they've just been celebrating the festival for the night before, and they wake up and suddenly their lives have been lost, and it's despicable. No, absolutely. Uh, and, and, and your turn. Um, we know that Israel is a very small place um, and uh, Israeli communities are very close, that everyone knows each other. Um, do you know any personal stories of, of people that you know in the south of Israel that uh, were brutally murdered, tortured uh, by Hamas? Uh, or those that have lost their lives serving in the IDF, defending the state of Israel on that fateful morning of Saturday, the 7th of October. Yeah, I, I can share the story of three soldiers who served on my base uh, at the Arrows Crossing, Lidol Makayas, Emil Smoilov and Dol Malka, who sadly lost their lives on that terrible Saturday morning. You know, they were spending a Saturday morning in base, they were doing their duties and suddenly over the border came the terrorists and they pillaged the crossing, they pillaged the base and, and they lost their lives in, in the fight trying to protect the base. Horrendous. Horrendous. I'm, and I'm just so pleased that you can really in a position to defend the state of Israel, um, not only on, on, in the media, which is the media war now, but also the diplomatic war as well. Um, uh, and what are your thoughts on what Hamas seem to be implementing. So we know that uh, during Israel's last military uh, ground offensive against Hamas uh, in Gaza in 2014, um, it was discovered then that Hamas were building terror tunnels to go under the Gaza Strip into uh, Israeli uh, communities to kill as many civilians as they could and then to take hostages back to Gaza. Uh, this very much seems like an implementation of that 2014 plan uh, that they didn't implement. Um, just share with us what it must be like for those uh, hostages now that, that are in, uh, they're actually in Gaza. We know that we've seen uh, the families um, describing how horrific this situation is, not knowing the fate of their loved ones, not knowing whether they're alive or dead, uh, knowing that they're going to be treated absolutely horrifically. Um, can you give any hope to the families of, of those uh, who have been kidnapped? What I can say is that one of the main objectives of the war, Swords of Iron, is to ensure the safe return of all of the hostages to the State of Israel. The highest political echelons of the State of Israel are dealing with the returns of the hostages as soon as they can, both in strength of body and in strength of soul, and we pray that they will return as soon as they can. Absolutely. So let's have a look at this uh, excellent and very emotional uh, CBN uh, news video. This one's called, We're Sheltered in a Bomb Shelter. Um, sister of IDF soldier taken hostage by Hamas and she recalls her accounts. could hear on the phone that something is wrong. I heard bombings and screaming and, uh, and people crying and she told we are bombed, we are uh, in the bomb shelter currently, all, all the girls. At 6.30 in the morning, Sasha Ariev was awakened by a phone call from her 19-year-old sister Karina, an intelligence officer in the IDF. Terrorists from Hamas were storming Karina's army base along the Gaza border. It happened so fast, they weren't prepared for it. It was a planned attack. She told that we should get uh, the news on TV to see that all the cities in the south of Israel are being bombed now. And then she said there is a raid on the base. She said the terrorists, they are here, we can hear them. They're shooting, not only bombing. She called uh, mainly to say goodbye, that she loves us, and that she wants uh, us to keep alive, and me especially, to keep the parents strong and do not sink in sorrow. Then Karina hung up and started texting so the terrorists wouldn't hear her. They wanted to hide so the terrorists won't find them, but they did. They were in the entry of the bomb shelter and that was actually the last message. Uh, the, the terrorists, they are here. No one imagined that it will be the last call. Uh, the last uh, thing that we heard of her, that she said goodbye. At least uh, we could uh, tell her that we love her. 
Sasha later identified her sister in this social media video, lying in the back of a car driven by Hamas. The image is horrifying. But Sasha still has hope for Karina's return. Maybe you don't see me crying, but I'm broken and devastated inside. I'm just trying to keep it together for my family, both parents and my uh, sister, and uh, to be strong and to believe and spread the hope that uh, she and uh, all the other hostages and missing people will come soon back home. We need not only us, but all the other families to know what is happening to their children, dead or alive, it doesn't matter, good news or bad news. She's my only sister, she, she's my heart. You know, I love my parents, but she's at first place. Because she's my little sister, you know, she's, uh, she's for me. I was the older one and she was born for me. Maybe for my parents either, but for me, so I will have someone in my life. I, I believe. I believe she will come back to me. And we really, really do need to pray for the return of Katrina and uh, the rest of those hostages that are held in Gaza, which is a war crime. Um, and it's barbaric and uh, Hamas should actually release them and do the right thing. But uh, it's just unthinkable. Uh, and also what's also an unthinkable, uh, Jonathan, is, is really what happened at the uh, Nova Music Festival at uh, a Kibbutz uh, Nareem that was very close to the Gaza Strip, that we see that uh, Hamas arrived in paragliders. Uh, you know, they murdered 260 young uh, Israelis in cold blood. Uh, there, there were cases of mass raping of young women going on there, as well as taking hostages back. I mean, I mean the, the survival stories coming out of that are, are just heartbreaking. You know, you see stories of couples who were attending this festival together and they were hiding in the bushes and one couple took a selfie to say, we're going to try and you know, remember this moment and we'll be able to laugh at this in a couple of days. And sadly, they didn't make it. And, you know, we found, uh, we found their bodies a couple of days later. People hiding within, you know, the, the chemical toilet booths, hiding in the bushes, running in any direction that they can. And some of the families haven't heard back yet where these people are. Some of these people managed to run away and they only resurfaced after 48 hours simply because they had no idea what was going on. And this is, you know, this is barbaric terrorism of the worst kind that it is. Come and, you know, and attack festival goers who are there simply celebrating life. And this is really unspeakable and unheard of. No, absolutely. And uh, we pray for those hostages uh, to return and uh, also pray that uh, Western governments that have an influence on Hamas can actually get them to get them released as well. And also the fact that there is foreign nationals as well that are, that are hostages, Americans, um, Germans, uh, including Brits as well. That places a bit more international pressure, doesn't it, on, on Hamas to say you need to release them. Absolutely. So I had the unfortunate honour of participating in Jake Marlowe's funeral, who was buried in Enfield two days ago, as we know, a British Israeli who made Aliyah to Israel two years ago. And he was buried here. And he was one of the security guards at this festival. And for a while he was missing and we didn't know what was going on. And as a show of solidarity from Foreign Secretary James Cleverly, he was the first Foreign Secretary on the ground to come and visit Israel and show support. And he went around and he visited the families of those who had been killed and of those who had been kidnapped. And all these visits from the, from the Western leaders to Israel show support both to the Israeli population and to the Israeli soldiers who realise that with international support, they will continue to fight for as long as they can in order to win this war. Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, and Jonathan, I had the um, real pleasure of visiting uh, Kibbutz Narim uh, last December, where we met uh, leaders of the uh, Eshkol Regional Council as part of the uh, Christian Media Summit. And um, what impressed me so much is that not only were the Kibbutz Narim and the kibbutzes around there, absolute beautiful kibbutzes with beautiful um, gardens and their hospitality was amazing. Uh, we, we, um, one of their spokesmen uh, spoke to us and, and she described the fact that living here 90% of the time is paradise, but that 10% is horrific when the rockets and missiles come over. Um, but also we, uh, we, we sat down, we had, uh, we had dinner with them, um, and um, they, the leaders of the Eshkol Regional Council shared their stories of, of surviving the rockets and missiles and what they're going through. And, um, you know, they thanked us for being there to show solidarity with them. Uh, and, and literally, I said, no, you don't need to thank us. We need to thank you because you are on the front line. You are defending the modern state of Israel. And also you're defending Israel from and the West from this dangerous 
cult-like demonic ideology uh, that is that is that is Hamas um, and that you're on the front line uh, and sadly today what's happened to Kibbutz Noreen, what's happened to so many of those kibbutzes uh, near the Gaza Strip is absolutely devastating, um, particularly uh, of what's been discovered at Kafar Azza. Can you just describe for us uh, what has been uh, discovered at Kafar Azza and, and, and how media broadcasters and others can actually deny what actually took place, which is nothing but, uh, but a program, a genocide, war crime. Uh, call it what you like, but it's beyond uh, horrific. Yeah, so Kafar Azza was one of the most successful communities in the peripheral community of Gaza. Before the Swords of Iron War started, there was a population of 400. 73 of those people are either dead or missing, which is 25% of a whole community wiped out. The future generations of that kibbutz no longer exist. And just like that, in one morning, the Hamas terrorists have managed to massacre not only the current population, but also any future population that were to be living there. 80% um, of those bodies were reported to have torture signs on them. There are pictures of burnt children, burnt mothers, burnt fathers. You know, it, it is speechless to be able to describe the pictures that were coming out from Kafar Azza. And you know, our prayers go out to all of those families and to the Zaka volunteers who had to go in there and recover the bodies and identify them, which is why it's taken so long, 12 days, and some families still don't know what's happened, just because it's impossible to identify some of the remains. Yeah. And Jonathan, can you um, describe with us um, what Zaka um, do? I mean, I became aware of them, I think, in the mid-90s when we had the horrendous um, Hamas suicide bombings that they would, and they would literally go and piece the bits of the dead bodies together. Um, share with us the very gruesome task that they did. And even when they went to Kafar uh, uh, Azza, this was even too much for them. Absolutely. I mean, these are, you know, normally religious men who are tasked with uh, tending to the bodies of people who have passed away. And they have to make sure that the body is in a certain condition to be able to be presented for burial under Jewish, condition, under, under Jewish traditions. Uh, and you know, they report back to us, both to the Israeli news and to the news worldwide, that some of the pictures that they have seen, they'd never seen before in their life, J just to you know, illustrate the barbaric manner of, of the way that these people were murdered by the Hamas terrorists. So let's uh, go to uh, this interview now with uh, Chris Mitchell, who interviews Israel's Minister of Intelligence to give us a briefing on the situation that Israel is facing. Perspective on the situation here in Israel, CBN News talked to Minister of Intelligence Gila Gamliel. Here's an excerpt from that interview. It's what you can tell us about Iran's involvement in the Hamas attack and also Hezbollah up on Israel's northern border. Uh, Iran is always there. Uh, they uh, give, they gave them the money. They gave them the uh, the mil uh, all the military. Uh, they uh, make them uh, to be prepared for uh, this uh, for for what they did. And um, Iran, they have the uh, Hamas and the Islamic uh, Jihad. They, they are the proxy of uh, Hamas and the Hezbollah too in uh, Lebanon and uh, the Houthis in uh, Yemen and uh, like you know all over. And uh, once and for all, we need to uh, understand that uh, everything is start uh, in Iran. Now they try to have a picture that uh, they're not a part of it. Maybe they not uh, they didn't know uh, exactly the day that it will open, but uh, they uh, they knew everything and they uh, they prepare and make all this uh, to uh, to get what uh, we had uh, yeah. in this uh, in this uh, un un make sense. Right. Uh, How significant is the U.S. support in the visit of President Joe Biden right now? Yeah, first of all, it's very, uh, very important. Uh, he will come tomorrow. And uh, the support that we got from the United States, it's very, uh, very, uh, you know, our heart is, uh, we thank you from uh, the bottom of our hearts uh, about uh, this uh, supporting because uh, now um, Israel uh, in the front of a war that uh, uh, we will win it uh, when uh, we got all this support from our brothers and sisters around the world. And uh, Biden, he will come. And um, let's hope that uh, what we got together will be uh, the needs of uh, Israel to win this war. What can you tell us, too, about a possible two-front war with Hezbollah up on the northern border? Uh, Lebanon uh, is... Uh, Mm -hmm. they, they need to understand that uh, 
they uh, have uh, the control about what is happening in the in their state and uh, israel is not is israel uh, doesn't want the war uh, with lebanon or with the hezbollah but we are prepared uh, and uh, if we'll need to be uh, so we will do it we have uh, and arrange everything uh, uh, we need to uh, to um, to win uh, the war and i can say for everybody around us who think that they can uh, uh, if they think that uh, this is the time for them i can say to them clearly don't don't yeah. do it exactly what us president said final question uh, minister any any final thoughts about what you'd want to say about uh, the situation right now? The situation right now is that uh, we are uh, give uh, and uh, work the understanding with uh, our army that uh, no Hamas anymore uh, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, it won't be uh, not their ideology, not their uh, uh, fighters, not their uh, regime not their leaders that control this uh, population inside the uh, Gaza. Uh, we will destroy them. Uh, and we won't uh, keep till we got the, the last of this Hamas outside Gaza Strip. Uh, and we will show um, them and the, all the world uh, that now supporting us uh, that uh, no one can do this horrible thing for uh, for humans these uh, crimes uh, that they did uh, it's uh, it's something that uh, nobody in the world can uh, give this uh, option to be uh, without uh, uh, take it, take this out of this world uh, because uh, we don't want that it will be a model for anybody around the world uh, to uh, to do things like this yeah. they are worse than isis about yeah. what they did and we will kill them till we will find the last one from the Hamas. Minister Gamliel, with your intelligence, just one last question. Are you concerned that, that, that the pressure that, or the sympathy that Israeli has right now will turn to pressure by the international community in, in a few days? Uh, it's always come uh, pressure from uh, from around. We, we we need our brother and sister, the Christian, like I told you. Uh, the pressure need to be against uh, the monsters and not against uh, the Israeli that are uh, uh, now need to protect and uh, bringing back the security for our citizen. Uh, so uh, do whatever you can uh, to keep this uh, pressure against them and not against us. So yeah. you have the. I believe in you. I know you. I'm with you more than 20 years. Uh, and uh, uh, what I want to ask from you, uh, keep prayer and be active to give uh, the Israeli uh, the opportunity to do what we need to uh, make Israel safe and bring the peace of Jerusalem back for all the citizens around Israel. And uh, thanks to uh, Chris Mitchell there for a great interview with uh, Israel's Minister of Intelligence. Um, Yotan, I, I have to be surprised, but I'm also very pleased by the response of the Conservative government um, to the most hideous terrorist attack in Israel's history. The, the fact that we've seen incredibly strong support shown by James Cleverly, as you mentioned, the first foreign secretary to uh, visit Israel during that time and, he, um, and on the news networks, he was on the news networks defending Israel the day after this terrorist attack. Uh, we've seen unwavering support by Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary, uh, but Rishi uh, Sunak himself has really demonstrated that he really is a true friend of Israel. And I, I just want to read out what he said powerfully um, to the Jewish community when he attended the um, synagogue in, in, in Finchley. He said that I am unequivocal, equivocal. Uh, there are not two sides to these events. Uh, there is no question of balance. I stand with Israel. We stand with Israel. The United Kingdom stands with Israel. Um, how reassuring is it for, for a diplomat knowing that the British government stands with the nation of Israel during this time of war and during this time of crisis? These are very clear calls of support from around the world, especially from Prime Minister Sunak. And knowing that we have the international backing both on the diplomatic front, but also on the military front, to continue to do what we do and to set out to reach these objectives that we need in order to win this war is the, most, is the strongest form of support that we could ask for, both, diploma, both diplomatically and militarily.
Um, absolutely. And, and also, um, we've, we've seen that as we're recording this programme today, that uh, US uh, President Joe Biden has uh, flown into to Israel. Um, I watched on I-24 the uh, press conference he had with uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, and it's almost unprecedented, isn't it, of a US president during uh, a time of war for Israel to fly into Tel Aviv. Uh, to meet with the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu as well as the um, uh, Israeli uh, President Herzog and to send a message to the Israeli people of solidarity and, and support. Share with us how much that means uh, for the Israeli people. I think President's Biden, President Biden's visit is a clear message of support from Israel's closest ally and it is a clear message to the Middle East. As he said very clearly in his statement earlier this week to any enemies around the Middle East who want to intervene in this war, don't. America is there. We have this, all the support that we need from our American allies. We will win this war. So effectively, he's uh, giving a warning to Tehran. Absolutely. Let's have a look at this uh, excellent CBN news um, report that says Israel is preparing for an imminent ground war. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken explained one of the main reasons for the president's visit. President Biden will underscore our crystal clear message to any actor, state or non-state trying to take advantage of this crisis to attack Israel. Don't. To that end, he's deployed two aircraft carrier groups and other military assets to the region. According to the Pentagon, about 2,000 U.S. troops may be deployed to the region to support Israel in intelligence and medical roles, should Israel launch a ground incursion into Gaza. Iran's foreign minister warned of a preemptive attack if Israel begins a ground invasion of Gaza and said time is running out. If the limited and extremely tight windows of opportunity available to the United Nations and political actors are not used over the coming hours, opening new fronts against the Zionist regime is inevitable. The IDF tells CBN News Iranian-backed Hezbollah is slowly escalating the situation on the northern border. So there's the threat of that being, um, of, of, of the, the border heating up even further. Speaking to a friend of mine um, uh, who um, was unable to come to work today because she was up until 6 o'clock in the morning. She lives in the north next to an artillery battery, and she was up until 6 o'clock with um, regular artillery fire into Lebanon. Uh, things are hot and getting hotter. Security expert Ari Sasha says Hezbollah presents a much more formidable military challenge than Hamas. Hamas is uh, the equivalent of AAA ball, the Toledo Mud Hens, which and they, they're a good team. Uh, but but um, Hezbollah is um, Hezbollah is the Boston Red Sox. They're a major league. They're a near peer, I would call them. This as new atrocities are emerging from the Hamas attacks on Israeli civilians. Hamas released this footage of a 21-year-old Israeli hostage kidnapped from Sterot. The IDF now says the total number of hostages is 199. On the Gaza border, Special Ops Sergeant Major Daron Kadar, fresh from the front lines, told CBN News this has unified all Israelis. What I can tell you is what this has done, it has united all of us across the board, whatever our political agendas were before this broke out. We are all coming together. The Air Force, the, the ground forces, the Navy, everybody is coming and we're ready to do our part to defend our country and to stand shoulder to shoulder. I know people that uh, are reservists uh, in the IDF. Um, I mean, Stefan Silva is one. Another a close Israeli family of mine. Um, their husband has now um, had to uh, join up as a reservist for the IDF. And uh, literally 360,000 IDF reservists has been, have been called up to fight Hamas in Gaza. It's imperative that we keep them in our prayers because they are on the front line of defending Israel from this evil that is Hamas. Uh, Jonathan, um, share with us the huge responsibility placed on these IDF soldiers now as we're in a situation now where Israel is poised to launch a ground offensive into Gaza to destroy uh, Hamas. But share with us how imperative it is that the IDF, the Israeli Defence Force, are able to destroy Hamas, destroy its terrorist infrastructure and also restore Israel's deterrent capabilities, which are so important. Yeah. So I think there are two answers to that question. The first one is to paraphrase a famous Hebrew saying, what was was, was was. There are ways that we previously treated Gaza Strip, ways that we previously allowed the Hamas 
to rule the way they wanted into the Gaza Strip. That can be no more. You don't need to look further away than last week to see what happens when you let Hamas uh, control their own rule within the Gaza Strip, and that can't happen anymore. With regards to what's going on in the future and how we're going to take this war, this massacre, learn from it, and make sure that we destroy the Hamas capabilities, I think I'm going to start with saying that Israel is the most moral army that we have in the world, and I can speak to that from personal experience. In my unit, we spent many a day mapping out any sensitive sites that we have within Gaza and making sure that within any war, none of these places are hit because these are going to be places where innocent civilians are going to be looking for shelter, whether it's hospitals or schools or libraries run by the UN, run by the Red Cross, run by some diplomatic representations as well within Gaza and making sure that these people aren't hit so that we can guarantee that whilst we fight to destroy the Hamas infrastructure, innocent civilian lives are not lost. Uh, and share with us how Hamas are actually cowards. They don't, um, they don't follow the Geneva Convention on Warfare. Um, they hide behind women and children. And no doubt they also use the, uh, uh, the hostages as uh, human shields. And, and of course, there will be uh, booby traps set probably for the IDF soldiers and others. Um, j just share with us an incredibly, um, uh, we know that Gaza's what, its population is over 2 million as well. So we're talking about a very densely uh, population and fighting that kind of urban warfare against, against these terrorists is going to be a difficult task. But share with us how, uh, for example, Israel has to deal with the fact that Hamas use women and children and hostages as human shields. Absolutely. So any battalion that goes into Gaza has a dedicated civilian population officer or CPO who is there in charge to make sure that the commander knows of anything sensitive within the area that he's about to take on. And the minute we go there and we have a civilian officer there advising the commander what to do, we know the best way to both keep the civilians safe and also take out the terrorists and be able to go forward more and more until we can reach our objectives. And, and Jonathan, um, give us your, your, main, uh, well, your thoughts really on, uh, on the mainstream uh, media coverage. As we're recording this program today, all the news last night was how Israel bombed a hospital in Gaza um, and they were very quick to accuse Israel of doing so without gathering the facts first. Uh, and now it turns out very clearly that this was actually a rocket fired by Palestinian Islamic Jihad from a cemetery close to the hospital that hit the hospital. Uh, and yet still our mainstream media and our main players uh, like the BBC and others are still wanting to blame Israel for this. Um, share how journalistic integrity is under threat when journalists and uh, media outlets don't actually report and get the facts right for themselves before they put out outrageous uh, statements and news reports. I think you've put it very well and I would say that any self-respecting media outlet should verify its sources before they do so. I just like you receive the push notifications immediately even from within Israel a hospital has been hit and they are blaming Israel for it and the Israeli spokesperson instead of sending out a rust message saying we're checking what's going on they took the time they checked and made sure that indeed it wasn't Israeli Air Force activity that would hit the hospital. And as the time went by, we managed to see recordings surface from within Gaza showing a rocket that had deviated from its trajectory and fell onto the hospital itself. I'd like to say that any official information also released by the Palestinian Ministry of Health should be taken with a pinch of salt. Because as we know, this Ministry of Health is run by Hamas. And I think it's quite astounding that they were able to say that 100 had died and they were able to, to make this assumption whilst in Israel it's taken us 12 days to count the amount of people who have died since that massacre that happened last Saturday. And in a matter of hours, Hamas have managed to say that these hundreds of people have died. So we need to take with a pinch of salt anything that is reported, especially by the Palestinian Ministry of Health in Gaza. And we have this uh, transmission now to actually listen to. And this was intercepted by the IDF. And uh, this is two members of Hamas talking and uh, actually reveals that Palestinian Islamic Jihad did fire that uh, rocket into the hospital in Gaza. This is the evidence.
هي وين لما تدخل على الساحه؟ اول ما تدخل على الساحه تدخلش على البلد عيدك اليمين في مستشفى المعمداني. اه عرفتها. I want to give you an announcement of the event that occurred in the hospital in Gaza. I can confirm that an analysis of the IDF operational systems indicates that a barrage of rockets was fired by terrorists in Gaza, passing in close proximity to the Al Hali Al Maadi hospital in Gaza at the time it was hit. Intelligence from few sources that we have in our hands indicates that the Islamic Jihad is responsible for the failed rocket launch which hit the hospital in Gaza. I repeat, this is the responsibility of Islamic Jihad that killed innocents in the hospital in Gaza. And like any uh, good journalist or news producer, it's important to get your facts uh, first before you then broadcast news reports saying that Israel carried out this attack on this hospital. As we know, this is the evidence I presented before you. And uh, the media has to be very, very careful how it presents uh, this conflict and this war, as many of this will be used to incite uh, um, Muslim communities across the Middle East and across Europe to hate Israel, and particularly with this climate of rising Jew hatred, our mainstream media has to be a lot more careful how it presents the news and the facts um, and getting the facts right before they uh, produce their news reports. Um, Jonathan, I also want to, I mean, we're, we're, the world is very much focused on what's happening in Gaza right now. We know that uh, sadly that a lot of the narrative has shifted away from the horror and the shock of what happened to Israel on Saturday the 7th of October, focusing on what's happening in, in Gaza as well. Uh, you've outlaid very clearly that the military objective is to destroy Hamas and its infrastructure and to restore Israel's deterrence capabilities. But can you also share with us the flashpoint, which is the north, and the fact that Israel's security situation is far more precarious in the north of Israel with the Iranian-sponsored terror proxy Hamas that have in the region of anything between 160 to 2,000 rockets and missiles, and many of them laser-guided, how this presents a completely different scenario for the state of Israel and the IDF. I think Iran has shown her true face in sponsoring both Hamas in the Gaza Strip and Hezbollah in Lebanon. I'd like to make it very clear that we are not interested in an escalation on the northern border, but the Israeli Defence Forces stand ready to protect Israel and her citizens. Absolutely. So just share with us, for example, as well, because I think this is so important, particularly when I've heard BBC news reports, for example, that uh, describe Hezbollah as a group. Now, when I think of what a group is, I think of maybe this is a, a rock band, a pop group. But the fact is that, isn't it, that Hezbollah, like Hamas, a genocidal terrorist organization that are determined to uh, to commit mass genocide against the Jewish people. So share with us how they share exactly the same ideology, even though they are they're Shia Muslims. Yeah. So uh, I think Iran, through her proxies, both Hezbollah and Hamas, have shown that their only real interest is to destroy the state of Israel and to destroy the truth of people, the Jewish people. They infiltrate Israel, they kill civilians. Hamas has kidnapped hundreds of people into Gaza and we don't know where they are. This is a clear violation of international law. And what we're looking at actually is a fight between good and evil. Iran, Hamas, Hezbollah and ISIS, they all share the same ideology, it just has a different name. They all seek for the destruction for the state of Israel, they seek to destroy Jews, and this is the reincarnation of ideologies that we saw in the middle of the last century. Uh, and um, Yotan, share with us how it's imperative that we put full blame and responsibility for the Hamas terrorist attacks um, at the leadership of the Islamic Republic of Iran in Tehran uh, uh, in using Hezbollah Hamas as one of their, uh, uh, their instruments of terror against the Jewish state. I think Iran realised that they are losing their grip on the Middle East. This might be related to why they, choose, they chose to do this attack right now. They feel like they are losing Influ influence that they have around the Middle East and around the world and they want to use their proxies to make sure that the world doesn't forget that Iran is where they are but I have one clear message the IDF will be there the IDF will win
And um, show, show your thoughts on uh, what a great job everyone at the Israeli Embassy is doing, because uh, I'm in t touch with, with your colleagues on, on almost a daily basis. Um, the amount of information um, they're giving me through, through the WhatsApp group is, is quite incredible, uh, as well as interviews with uh, possible interviews with, the, uh, with those that have been kidnapped in Israel, latest up-to-date situation. Share with us how Israel is actually now viewing the media as another war front, as well as the idea of preparing for a ground offensive against Hamas. Absolutely. So uh, the ambassador, the deputy ambassador and the spokesperson are active on the media all the time making sure to fight for Israel's good name, securing that legitimacy that we have in order to extend the amount of time that we have to work within Gaza and have international support for everything that we do. This is an equally important battle as there is in preparation for the ground invasion, which we think will happen. Right. And on a personal show, share how, for example, the, uh, the Israeli embassy and, and how you as a diplomat and your other colleagues as well must be pretty exhausted because you're not having weekends, you're not having time off. Uh, my phone's going constantly with, uh, with information and updates. Um, just share with us the, the strain as well that this is placing on you guys personally and how our viewers also need to keep uh, the Israeli diplomats in our prayer as well because you are working on so many different fronts in this country. Uh, you're doing media interviews, uh, you're obviously speaking to uh, parliamentarians and also the government uh, of what's happening, including the Foreign Office and others, but also helping Israelis living here to get back to Israel so they can join up with the units and defend the only one and only Jewish state. I think that's probably the crux of what it is. Anyone who's in this job has a burning passion for the state of Israel, and that's what drives us to go forward. We sign up for this job, we know exactly what we're doing, we are the best people in the best position to make sure that Israel has the best name, especially in the UK, but all over the world. Yeah. And for our viewers watching, uh, Jonathan, how can they, how can they help? What, what practical steps can you give them to, to support with Israel? Because I know that so many evangelical Christians who love Israel are really praying for Israel at this time, which I think is important, but also there has to be practical things done as well. So what uh, practical initiatives can, can you recommend to our viewers that they can do to really stand with Israel? I think, as well as you said, keep us in your prayers all the time. Support the spread of truth. You know, fight misinformation, stay online, anything you see that is wrong, report it, tag each other, tag us, make sure that the right information is spread out to the right people so that everyone knows that we are on the right side of this war. Absolutely. And I think the other aspect to this conflict we're seeing in this war in Israel is the, the plight of the Jewish community uh, in this country and Jewish communities um, throughout the West because literally there's been almost a 500% increase in instances of Jew hatred uh, in this country, um, both physically and also online. Um, the Jewish community sadly gets the blame for what's happening in Israel when Israel is a democratic state and all she's doing is defending herself against this demonic ideology uh, and Islamist terrorists who are, who are members of Hamas to defend her citizens, uh, which is the first duty of any state. But share with us how uh, beleaguered and how how threatened the uh, UK Jewish community feels. So, at the the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary recognised this very, very quickly, and they quickly announced they were allocating further money into the budget to protect the Jewish people. The CST, who stand outside our synagogues and our Jewish institutions, are there all the time to make sure that we feel protected. And especially last week, on the Sabbath after the massacre started, made sure that we could go to our synagogues and pray and feel safe in doing and living our Jewish life. Absolutely. And I saw the pictures on uh, Monday, the 9th of October, only two days after Israel's mass terrorist attack by Hamas that uh, we saw. And the embassy was being boarded up. And uh, we've seen uh, last weekend, for example, over 30,000 pro-Palestinian demonstrators uh, meeting in London. Uh, and what was so sickening is that many of them had um, like uh, pictures of the Hamas paragliders on their, on their backs, on their rucksacks. Others are chanting, uh, Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. And we've seen that the Muslim Council of Britain have come out publicly to say that this is not anti-Semitic. But, but are they living in the real world? Because this is nothing but incitement to genocide. So when we see supporters of the Palestinians say, chant, Palestine will be free to the river to the sea, don't they mean the Jewish state from the, the River Jordan? all the way to the Mediterranean, which is the state of Israel. And, and that is incitement to genocide. I, I would agree with you that this is incitement and we are working closely with the Metropolitan Police to make sure that chants like this can't be said. You know, th th these are people who are looking actively and calling for the incitement against Jews, 
both here and both around the world. And we hope that the Metropol Metropolitan Police will be able to find these people and make sure that they are punished. Yeah, and, and share the work you guys are doing with the Israeli Embassy with the excellent work being carried out by the uh, Community Security Trust that provides uh, security for the Jewish community. You go to any uh, communal event and you'll see members of the CST there, whether it's a synagogue, whether it's a, a pro-Israel meeting or even uh, even Shaw's synagogues as well. So share with us the very important work that they do in, in giving that visible protection of the Jewish community. So as you say correctly, the CST have dedicated volunteers who for years have been present at any Jewish institution and just seeing the people there with their tags and with their badges make people feel safer already. I think that's the visible protection that you're talking about. But they also do a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes to make sure that any reports that they get of people who feel unsafe within the UK, they know how to speak to the police and make sure that these people are dealt with. Absolutely. And also I want to talk about, um, go back on, a little bit on the kind of media reports. Now, uh, uh, Israel's war against Hamas has created a, a big debate with our national uh, broadcaster, the BBC, uh, because they refused to call Hamas terrorists. They, they called ISIS terrorists and apparently they even called the, um, the terrorists who killed and murdered those two Swedish uh, football supporters in Brussels terrorists. Uh, they called the IRA terrorists, they called those uh, from Al-Qaeda committed 9-11 terrorists. But why is it different when it comes to Israel and the Jewish people that they have to call them groups, militant or government? Uh, and, and this is offensive, highly offensive to me, highly offensive to you, but also more offensive to the victims of terrorism. I think both Israel as a country uh, and the Jewish people here have a problem with the fact that the BBC seem to have an inability to call what this is terrorism. As you said, immediately they called the ISIS attack in Belgium the other day a terrorist attack, but we are 12 days on from the massacre that happened on the 7th of October and they still haven't been able to say the word terrorism. This is something that is really, really strange, re really weird that they have an ability to not be able to do this. They have been called out publicly, both by our diplomats and both by the Jewish community, and I hope that Ofcom hold them to the standards that they need to be held at. Absolutely, which is very important. And we soon also that uh, Grant Shapps, our, our Defence Secretary, has also got involved and, and criticised the BBC for calling them militants or, or gunmen, which is absolutely pathetic. Um, I, we have a lot of our, our viewers watching the programme today, uh, Jonathan, who, who really want to pray for the protection of Israel. They want to pray for the peace of, of Jerusalem at this time. We know that your country is in war. Um, what issues and how should they pray for Israel? I mean, pray for the IDF and, and pray for the citizens as well so what would you recommend pray for the IDF pray for the state pray for the families pray for the hostages and pray that we win this war and pray that there will be peace as soon as possible absolutely and uh, with this um, a ground offensive that we know that is, is imminent um, describe for us the fact also of viewers watching that this is probably going to be the biggest military offensive that we've seen in over four decades not since um, the Lebanon war of 1982 and the scale of it. So share with us um, how important it is that, that what Israel is doing and how all Israelis are kind of united behind the IDF right now as they know that your nation is under attack and your nation is fighting for, for its survival. As I said earlier, Hamas can't continue to rule Gaza as they have. And if the only way to make sure that the Hamas rule is completely destroyed is by going into Gaza, then the leaders will have to decide and make that decision. The Israeli public is completely behind the IDF at this point and they know that the, a strong support from Israel means that the IDF will have a strong way of going forward to this battle. Yeah, excellent. And uh, Jonathan, um, Israel as a nation means so much to me. I mean, I first visited Israel when, when I was a student at the University of Manchester in, in 96. I spent three months with Hebrew U out there, uh, learning Hebrew, uh, exploring the, uh, the country, having lectures from the um, uh, university lectures from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem there. Uh, the friends I made, the Jewish friends that I made uh, during that time were, were incredible, mainly mainly American Jews. Um, but my time in Israel then has, has been special. It, it, it's been on my heart ever since. And um, I never thought that uh, back in 96, when I was discussing the peace process then with Netanyahu first coming to, to power as Israel's prime minister, um, that I'd actually be doing this job. But, but it's times like this when, when Israel is at war um, that we need to tell the truth of Israel's cause, to, to rally support for Israel and, and for the state. Um, how imperative is it that, that, that Christians show that support, show that solidarity with Israel and the Jewish community so, they, they, so you know that you're not alone and also the Jewish community in this country know they're not alone and that you have 
very passionate friends that are standing with you during this time of war and this uh, time of crisis, uh, probably the biggest crisis in Israel's uh, 75 years as a modern state. Israel is home to many sites of various importance to the Christian religion, and we keep those sites safe because we understand that there is a historic importance between Israel and the Christian community. All your prayers and all your support that we have for the Christian community to the State of Israel are imperative for the support and for the legitimacy that we have to continue doing what we do. Absolutely, and it's so important, isn't it, where there are lots of pro-Israel uh, rallies taking place to actually attend them, where there's um, inaccurate news reportings to, uh, to call up the journalists or the newspaper that have written those articles, um, to reach out also to uh, Jewish colleagues as well, isn't it, um, to show that support and love as well. So there's lots of practical things that can be done. I think any person who has a Jewish friend or an Israeli friend has the personal responsibility to send them a message and make sure that they are okay at these times because many of us are not okay. And any message of support that you can send, I trust, I, I promise you, is the best way to show your friendship at this time. Uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for being my guest on the Middle East Report. You've done a great job today, but can I re reassure you of our friendship and our commitment to stand with Israel and the Jewish people at this time of crisis and time of war. And, and our, our love for Israel is unwavering. And it's imperative that we stand up and tell the truth of Israel's righteous cause at this very critical time in Israel's history. We appreciate all the words. We appreciate all the prayers. Thank you very much. And I just want to thank you for watching this program. Please continue to pray for Israel. Please continue to speak up for Israel. Please encourage your Jewish and Israeli friends. They're not alone. And continue in your support for the Jewish state. So thank you for watching this week's edition of the Middle East Report.